Hey there folks, I'm Mark in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse and this, it's Billboard Breakdown. I mean, I think we can call this week close to normal. Feels like it. After our new number one that shook the boards last week, it seems like we're hitting a point where we're starting to settle in for the home stretch of this Hot 100 year, especially without any huge major releases on the horizon. Hell, granted, surprise releases, they will happen, and we still haven't gotten those big Drake and Kendrick projects that folks have been hyping. But with the continued delay for touring, we might not see those albums in full for some time. You never know. Now, I say all that, even though looking at our top 10 with WAP by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion holding the number one thanks to continued big sales, strong streaming, huge YouTube, and somehow a radio run, we do have a new number two that seems to imply a fair bit more is coming. Laugh Now, Cry Later by Drake featuring Lil Durk. I'll have more to say about this song later on, but given its strong streaming across the board and the fact that it's already beaten WAP on its radio run, we could well up a song that very well could get to number one given its momentum right now, presuming it sticks around. Now this knocks back Rockstar by DaBaby and Roddy Rich down to number three, as it looks like it's now fading a bit in streaming and it's peaked on the radio, but not as much as Blinding Lights by The Weeknd down at number four, which is actively dropping in all categories and is basically riding out its sales and radio momentum for as long as that'll last. Then we have What's Poppin' by Jack Harlow and crew at number five, which is also losing radio, but might be propped up a little bit longer by its streaming. But for now, we gotta get to the streaming phenomenon that I sure as hell did not see coming. Debuting at number six, Seven Summers by Morgan Wallen. Yeah, this is a country debut in the top 10, and we'll get into the track later on as well, but you can also tell Nashville Radio is not on top of this. No, like the last country adjacent song that rocked to the top of the charts, this got its boost thanks to TikTok. I mean, at this point, I'm kind of fascinated how this slid around the usual Nashville gatekeepers, or in, if indeed they weren't already involved because how much calculation went into this big debut. Because with this much streaming before even the radio introduction, I'm genuinely fascinated how much staying traction this will have in the top 10 or hell, even the top 40. Hell, it knocked back Watermelon Sugar by Harry Styles down to number seven, which might be still climbing on the radio, but it's fading everywhere else. And Roses, I'm a Beck remix by St. John down to number eight, which in contrast to its streaming stability just started bleeding in the radio this week. Then we got Savage Love by Josh685 and Jason Derulo at number nine. And I gotta admit, I'm a little bit surprised this song's momentum's starting to stall out. It's still on that radio run, but the sales and the streaming, they they aren't rising to catch up, which to me implies some folks might be getting more sick of this song faster than Jason Derulo or his handlers were reckoning. But finally, cracking the top 10 after hovering below it for a while, and another slice of country making penetration, although not a good song, I Hope by Gabby Barrett is at number 10. She got a big remix with Charlie Puth, which is actually credited and gives her momentum for the radio run, but the sales are not surging and the streaming lags significantly, so this song will go just about as far as the radio allows, and that might not be a lot. And given some of the information that's leaking about her, I'm kind of okay with that. It's not like the song's good either. And that transitions nicely to our losers and dropouts. First, we had two big dropouts that clinched their year-end list spots. Super Lonely by Benet and Gus Dapperton, along with Hard to Forget by Sam Hunt. There's a year-end list with that song's name on it. And then after that, Don't Rush by Young Team Bugsy featuring Hetty One, and One Big Country Song by Low Cash. They dropped off early, but it also looks like Be Kind by Marshmallow and Halsey is gonna potentially just miss on the year-end list for 2020 as it falls out. It just underperformed which sadly might have been the story of Halsey's 2020. Now, our losers, they're mostly all over the place. Off the debut last week, the only song that fell really hard was Smile by the late Juice World in the weekend, down to 35. And on a note for Juice World, the Hate the Other Side with Polo G, Marshmello, and Kid Leroy also went to 93. Then Rod Wave's miniature album bomb dropped off a little bit, with Rags to Riches slotting back to 22. I'm still amazed that did as well as it did. And Girl of My Dreams at 75. And we're all 
while we're also in album mom territory, we all saw the expected fades for Taylor Swift with The One at 67 and Exile with Bon Iver at 82, and for Pop Smoke with Something Special at 98 and Got It On Me at 85. Then we had the continued fade for My Future by Billie Eilish at 54, which is because it looks like radio completely ignored it. And then we have the cuts that are fading out a little more naturally. Say So by Doja Cat and Nicki Minaj is at 43. Done by Chris Jansen is at 63. I mean, if I keep saying it's fading away, it might go away. Then we had Stuck With You by Ariana Grande and Justin Bieber crashing at 90. And Mamacita by the Black Eyed Peas, Azuna, and J. Ray Soul at 87. I mean, the sooner this goes away, the better. Now, our gains this week do feel a little strange, specifically our returns, both from Polo G, with Martin and Gina back at 83 and 21 back at 99. This might be a synergistic element across of YouTube, as 21 has had a video for a while, but Martin and Gina finally got it. I mean, I like the song. I hope it's a single that does well. Maybe this is the spark that'll get it there. But what's more promising are our two gains. Well, okay, really just one game, as I call Mama by Tim McGraw got its bounce to 78 on Nashville radio support and the fact the album dropped. No, no, no. What I'm excited for is a huge pickup from the debut last week of Mood by 24K Golden and Ian Dior at 26. I mean, putting aside how much I like the song, kind of hits for me in the same way I know Blueberry Fago hits for a lot of friends of mine. Right now, minus the radio push, it's set up to be a big hit. Good start on streaming. It's got TikTok traction. It even picked up some sales. And while well, it's been pointed out to me, it's got a similar cadence and bounce to Martin and Gina. Still a bounce I really like. I'm happy they both could potentially become hits. But all right, on that note, let's come down considerably to talk about our new arrivals. And we got to start with number 100, Lonely If You Are by Chase Rice. Yeah, I'm lonely if you are, if you are, if you are. All right, look, we don't need to keep doing this. Just because Chase Rice is releasing music doesn't mean we have to dignify it. And someone should tell Broken Bo that he's not the bankable star that's worth any sort of attention if you're not giving cash to push a Jason Aldean single. Especially if you're relying on songs that require eight months to gain that sort of traction. This is off an EP that dropped in late January. And let's be honest, did anyone care that EP came out? Seriously? Because not only are we dealing with another flagrant Kane Brown ripoff instead of just relying on the flat, questionably blended delivery of Chase Rice with the fake hand claps that relies not just on the sentiment that if she's lonely, he'll fake being lonely too, but hey, you can text him and he will love the lonely out of you. I mean, it just feels so flatly manipulative that we can't even get into the crash my party problem where he sounds dejected that he's gonna hook up instead of partying with his friends because he's not good at conveying sentimentality, which has been a persistent issue in his entire career thus far. But hey, once again, Chase Rice is living up to his name. He's chasing the trends. I mean, I'm just happy to leave him behind. Next. Number 92, Caramello by Ozuna. <laughs> All right, look, I'm a few years into not liking Azuna, and since I've been watching a lot of NBA, the first thing that my mind went to is that this is a misspelled tribute to Carmelo Anthony. I mean, if only it was that, with Azuna caterwauling through painfully awkward and weirdly tinny vocal layering, as the guitars, of course, get swamped out before you get your utterly generic reggaeton percussion, and that drops in, which sounds as stiff and sterile as ever. And from there, it's yet another hookup slash love song where this girl, Azuna, is into tastes like caramel and he's comfortable getting abused by her in every way. I'm fairly certain this falls under the definition of simping and I'm not sure why the beat audibly drop out multiple times across the verses. There's no punchlines here. In fact, there's not much of anything. It's forgettable as hell. Next, number 71, 24 by Money Man featuring Lil Baby. Yay, another generic trap song from the verse from Lil Baby to give this guy traction? I mean, I'll be honest, aside from an impressively generic rap name, I had no idea who Money Man even was before this song, even despite the fact he apparently put out a mixtape every other month and generic might be the word of the day here because he sounds like a fusion of future and little baby with way too much mushy auto-tuning as the generic trap percussion and the faded guitars.
verse. Almost, I would go back to the term of calling him a mumble rapper. I'm not even going to say the little baby's verse is good here, but he's at least somehow more distinctive. But the problem with Money Man is that he just brings nothing interesting in terms of a hook or a melody or content. Outside of flexing, delivered with no impact, screwing his girl, and shooting the haters, there's just nothing here. And a lack of any sort of dynamic presence or transition means that nothing's going to stand out. The verse just runs into the chorus and vice versa. So again, I'm going to forget this exists in record time. Let's move on. Number 66, Lemonade by Internet Money and Gunna featuring Don Tolliver and Nob. Well, there's a whole lot of names attached to this song that I have less than zero interest hearing working together. So when five of the Internet Money producers team up for this, I had less than zero expectations, which might have been the best way to approach this song. Given that Nob and Don Tolliver are trying to split the difference and how much they can rip off Travis Scott against a lot of a washed out guitar line that frankly has nothing close to the atmosphere of Astro World, courtesy of the lumpy bass and the very clicking trap hi-hat. I mean, plus the Gunniverse that I guarantee everybody will forget the second after hearing it. I, I mean, I guess once you clue into the fact that the content's gonna be completely empty and vacant. The best thing I can highlight is Don Tolliver's hook. But he's also got that pseudo auto-tuned warbling that Post Malone's really pioneered that's still not nearly charming enough to click for me. So while it might have something to it, I'm not really on board with this. Sorry. Number 61, Heather by Conan Gray. Polyester, but you like me better. Wish I kind of surprised to see Conan Bray on the Hot 100. I reviewed his album Kid Crow earlier this year and I didn't really like it so I guess I should be happy enough that this is getting pushed with the single that TikTok likes and not Affluenza until you hear how this might be the most shameless Billie Eilish ripoff by a guy that I've heard in a while. From the bare bones acoustics, the super hushed delivery and especially the pre-chorus backing vocal melody. Now the writing kind of reminds me more than a bit of Wish You Were Gay and the anxious high school yearning, there are a lot of parallels until Conan Gray decides to belt and has to be pushed back further in the mix to disguise some of the cracks in his delivery. It's a pretty obvious tactic, producers. A lot of us are getting keen to it. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad. I don't mind the adolescent structure or how it's left kind of unclear how the person who he likes but only has eyes for Heather could be of any gender nice touch, I guess. But I've also seen folks highlight how it might as well just be the junior version of Little Big Town's Girl Crush, and while it doesn't play up the bait and switch, it also seems a lot clumsier for the effort. I don't know, to me it's just kind of thin, kind of derivative of its very obvious influences. It's not bad, but outside of any sort of infatuation with Conan Gray and how pretty he is, just not a lot that draws me here. Next up, number 58, Casey Talk by Young Boy Never Broke Again. Big boss, I'm knowing I ain't hearing out a young nigga saying Double pack twice in a row, three string bitches pains all in my home First string, tell it out when I make a song Let him let my brother day he ain't make it home mm -hmm. First thought that went through my mind was, what could Casey Musgraves have to do with Young Boy Never Broke Again? But the second being that it probably isn't her, but it also seems like Young Boy's been kind of quiet this year, or that his material hasn't quite been landing with the same staying power in my mind that it used to. But this is actually directed at Young Boy's infant son named Casey, though you wouldn't know it off a side of a quick reference it at the end of the second verse, as most of the song is the same sort of flexing and gunplay that of course we expect from him. But what I think bugs me the most is how creaky the song is. The guitar feels really rickety against the rougher trap percussion and all the sloshing sounds. Youngboy's voice is breaking in a way that kind of reminds me a bit of Roddy Rich, but not nearly as charming. It just feels really unpolished and unrefined. And even on the low standards I hold, Youngboy never broke again. I know he could make something a bit better than this. I mean, it's not terrible, he's made worse, but it certainly is forgettable. Next, number 14, Midnight Sky by Miley Cyrus. Oh, no. 
Let's be blunt, there have been very few stars who have been allowed to stumble as hard as Miley Cyrus has the past decade, and the fact that she somehow cracked the top 20 again left me thinking she was probably getting another placement via birthright in existing stands rather than any sort of unique or cohesive artistic vision or any sort of development. But okay, is the song at least good this time? Well, it's a bit of a pivot, picking up a lot of the sharper Dua Lipa 80s inspired grooves and the thicker sense that could conceivably fit with Miley's throatier rasp, provided her vocals are placed well, which with some of the tinny mastering emphasizing her rawness, I'd argue she cannot command the mix in the same way that Dua Lipa can, and I know Miley could do that, nor does the vocals blend all that well if there's not going to be any sort of distorted punch in the instrumentation. Honestly, this is a song that's crying out for some of the rough edges you'd hear on, let's say, an early 80s Pat Benatar song, especially with a minor key melody and some of the bitter post-relationship brooding in the content. Give this a real guitar, this could kick ass. So. You know what, even if the hook is good, I think Miley can sell this, and it's got more groove than I think she's ever had. Also kind of reminds me of F.U., her long-forgotten deep cut from Bangers. It's probably still her best song to this day. I think as of now, this might have to grow on me. It's not bad by any means, but I get the feeling this should be better. Let's move on. Next up, number six, Seven Summers by Morgan Wallen. On a sixer with me, does it ever make you sad to know? Alright look, I've gone on the record multiple times that Morgan Wallen has frustrated me or has fallen short of what he could deliver, so with the song of his debuting in the top 10, I either expected the crossover pivot or just a really strong hit that could contend. Okay. I have high standards for country, and even the best of the mainstream in 2020 in that genre could be tough to beat, so I'm not going to say this is excellent. But I will say I've got a soft spot for bittersweet songs where Morgan Wallen is clearly wondering if this girl who moved on with her life and found more success, whether or not she thinks of him in the back of her mind, especially as he very much got left and stuck behind. There's a wistfulness to the song that does feel honest, especially opposite a remarkably organic instrumental palette and production. Yeah, the entire mix is a little bit over-compressed and a shade bit muddy for my taste because Joey Moy, but the guitars are warm, the drums sound organic, and there's a little bit more going on in the lead melody that doesn't quite feel as predictable, and I'll praise that. Now again, I'm not really sure there is so much here that sets this apart beyond just capturing a moment on TikTok. I mean, if you want Joey Moy produce wistful cuts in this exact lane, Jake Owen put out LAX in 2016, and it's basically this, but better across the board. That was one of my favorite songs of that year. But I will say I like that this went viral. It proves that there is an audience that will accept an organic, solid country song beyond Nashville just chasing the pop trends. And to me, that's reassuring that you can still build that organic audience. So yeah, you know what? This is not a great song, but it is a good one. Good work, man. I'll take it. And finally, number two, Laugh Now, Cry Later by Drake featuring Lil Durk. Baby, I took a half and she took the whole thing slow down. Baby. Am I the only one who thinks that Drake using this as a lead-off single for his album Certified Lover Boy is a weird choice? Maybe it's the glorified Nike commercial for the music video. Maybe it's Drake's haphazard choice of singles now. Maybe it's just how generally underwhelming the song is in both music and content, but this did not really impress me. Especially when I like Drake's hungrier, darker edges that you got in his last couple sets of singles from 2019, which you would think would be a good match for Lil Durk. Instead, the horns opposite the more developed bass line are a bit of an odd fit, an opulence undercut by the fidgety energy that Drake's sing raps through with a complacency that does not interest me or enthuse me. And what irks me more is that, just like on Sicko Mode, Drake's still throwing subliminal shots targeting Pusha T in a beef that he lost over two years ago. That entire third verse, man, is still clearly on his mind that 40s girl leaked the info that Drake was hiding a child. And it doesn't seem like he's quite settled on how it all fell out. Especially as his first verse, shots at Kanye West, actually kind of land really well. I like that gap line. I guess if this is your leadoff single, it feels counterproductive to still be pissy about a beef you lost. Especially when Lil Durk is here and he wasn't involved to begin with. 
I mean, he's taking shots at 6'9", but that's more of a passing target. Similar to how Drake references in his certified lover boy crooning some girl. I don't know, I think Drake can make tighter and more interesting and impactful music than this. And as such, this feels like an album cut or a late single, not something to push an album, especially given how calculated he was with the release of Scorpion and its singles, even when some of his plans were altered behind the scenes. So, I don't know, it's passable, I don't hate it, it'll probably work. I'm just not really a fan. But it also makes for a week that might be more normal, but doesn't have a lot of quality. I guess Seven Summers by Morgan Wallen will take the best, but honorable mention, Midnight Sky by Miley Cyrus? If only because I can see it growing on me the most? Maybe? Now the worst is easily Lonely If You Are by Chase Rice, with dishonorable mention, that's gonna go to KC Todd by Young Boy Never Broke Again, if only because somehow it's a real disappointment, and for as creaky and underwhelming as the song was, I think he can do better. But next week, you know, unless BTS's dynamite blows everything open, we could be settling into a bit of a rhythm, so stay tuned. Until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.